What a blessing it is to have Dr. Jim Fleming with us this morning and then at 6.30 this evening, Monday and Tuesday evenings, and 11.30 on Monday and Tuesday. You have read about Dr. Fleming and uh, you know uh, his all of his experiences. And I don't want to take any of his time, but I just want to say that every time I've heard him teach, I have been blessed and I have learned something new. In fact, I've learned many new things. I told him this morning that I remember more of the things that he has taught me than I remember my own sermons. I would appreciate you not making any comments about that (laughs) later on. But it is a real blessing to have Jim with us. I was privileged to serve on the staff with him at First Church in Houston. And Susan and I were privileged to travel to Israel for our first trip to Israel with with Jim. And uh, we will never forget uh, those times and those moments of teaching and learning. Jim? So glad to have you back with us. (laughs) Thank you, Tim. Yes, thank you, Pastor Brewster. It's nice to be back. Uh, I was here's uh, just calculating it. It was seven years ago. It's always encouraging when a congregation invites you back again. Uh, usually, it takes about seven years to recover from one visit to another. I do remember fondly the trip where the Brewsters were with a group from Houston, and uh, at the same time in Israel, I had been teacher for three months with a Roman Catholic. A missionary order called the Marino Fathers. And on the day our group was going to go to visit the Dead Sea, they were able to join us. Our itinerary actually went a little bit faster than we thought that day, so we decided to throw in one last visit at a very remarkable place uh, in what was called Mount Sodom. It's a 98% salt mountain that has places eroded by water that are caves, but to explore those caves are nice because it's like you're in a glacier because your flashlight penetrates the walls, which are crystallized salt, uh, and it's very beautiful. Well, we had given people a choice to stay at the bus or take this 45-minute trip into this cave. I did not realize it, but uh, a couple of days before, there was a heavy rain that brought lots of mud into the cave. And there were several places where you have to go down uh, tumbled rocks. And uh, we noticed that we were needing three points instead of two points to negotiate. So we were rather dirty when we got out. When we came out again, because it was a little bit scary on some of the slotty places, uh, one of the members of First Methodist said, Oh, I'm so grateful we had the priest along because I was afraid. Without skipping a beat, Pastor Brewster looked up and said, What am I, chopped liver? (laughs) (laughs) The priest really liked that one too. Okay, so. It's great to be back with you folks again, and I'm humbled because we're here at a very important of the season during Lent, and I've been asked to share some uh, discoveries that help us better understand uh, Holy Week, Jesus last week in Jerusalem. Jesus' life can be divided up into some major turning points. Before I read our scripture, I'd like to remind you of the turning points that lead up to our text. The first three turning points in his life were related to his relative, John the Baptist. We have his turning point from obscurity in the Nazareth area to his public ministry with his baptism by John in the Jordan River. Jesus ministered in Judea and Galilee. The second turning point is mentioned in Matthew 4. When Jesus heard that Herod Antipas had arrested John the Baptist, he moved from Nazareth to Capernaum, so literally a geographical turning point. He stops his early Galilean ministry in the Nazareth area, then moved his base of operation to Capernaum on the Sea of Galilee. Matthew's Gospel tells us the reason was Herod arrested John. John is Jesus' relative. It's probably safer for Jesus' family. 
if Jesus is not living in Nazareth, his hometown. There might be emissaries from Herod who also want to arrest Jesus. So Jesus moved to Capernaum. We're not told specifically why he chose Capernaum, but we have a good guess. Before Herod had arrested John, there was a market official. The word is agoronomos, in charge of the agora, the market in Capernaum, who had a very sick son. And he heard Jesus was in the Nazareth Cana area. And in John 4, he went and found Jesus. Remember, that's when Jesus told him, go your way, your boy will be all, all right. Jesus has a friend in high places in Capernaum, a sympathetic follower because God has healed his son through Jesus. With a paranoid governor and with lack of civil liberties during Roman occupation, Jesus was grateful to have a friend in high places in Capernaum. He would not, quote, notice that Jesus was there or that large crowds were assembling on the hillsides above Capernaum. May I use the espionage word cover? He had cover with the sympathetic high official in Capernaum. When I have students from developing countries without civil liberty or public assembly being permitted, they often wonder out loud, how could Jesus have had such a high profile ministry around the shores of the Sea of Galilee? It was this official whose boss would Herod Antipas. You know, Herod Antipas had a palace in Tiberias only seven miles away from Capernaum. But he's not reporting the crowds around Jesus. The reason Herod Antipas was the longest surviving Herodian ruler, 46 years, is he never allowed anyone to be popular with the crowds. He quickly had them arrested. So the arrest of John the Baptist, in fact, Herod Antipas put him in a prison on the red end of the Arabian, edge of the Arabian desert, far away from the crowds. Our third turning point is also related to John, the death of John. Word reached Galilee that Herod Antipas had killed John the Baptist. Many of John's followers were Galileans. How did they know about John? Whenever they would go from Galilee down the Jordan Valley on their way to Jerusalem for a feast or festival, they would pick up a few John the Baptist sermons. And Jesus was told, Herod has killed John, and Herod wants to see you. May I paraphrase that for you? Herod has just finished seeing John. It is not good news. Herod Antipas rules Galilee, where Capernaum is. When Jesus heard that Herod wanted to see him and that he had killed John, he said to his disciples, let's get in a boat and withdraw to the other side of the sea. That's ruled by Herod Philip, not Herod Antipas. Let's withdraw to the other side of the sea and rest for a while. When the crowd saw them leaving in a boat, they ran along the shore and they got to the deserted places of Bethsaida. It's only about a four mile run along the shore. And as they got there, they saw Jesus and the 12 get out of the boat. And hoping to find a retreat, instead they found a couple thousand people waiting for them. Did you know the largest occasion of people hearing Jesus is the death of John the Baptist? This is the feeding of the 5,000 story. And when Jesus' disciples saw this crowd, they said to Jesus what you and I would say to him, Lord, send them away. We need a break. It's so sad to hear about what's happened to John. The text says Jesus was moved with compassion when he saw the crowds. That word compassion in both the Greek and 
Hebrew languages is the word for the pit of the stomach. He had a deep pit of the stomach feeling for the crowds. And he said, he saw them as sheep without a shepherd. Their shepherd had been John. And now John was killed by the government. He spoke to them the rest of the day. And that's the setting of a miraculous feeding. When they went home, Jesus remained and stayed and prayed. May I suggest to you a content for what his prayer may have been? The market official, who for perhaps as much of as a much of a year has not noticed Jesus was in Capernaum. Capernaum is a town of about 3,000 people. It probably would be dangerous for him. His boss is Herod Antipas if he stayed in Capernaum. In fact, perhaps you recall, he, during that year, had made two other friends in high places in Capernaum. The Roman legion that patrolled the road had a centurion who had a son or a servant who was sick. And remember, he's the one who said, uh, sent word to Jesus, I understand giving and taking orders and authority. I believe you have authority from God. You say the word, the boy will be okay. He's not going to report Jesus to the Roman legionnaire courts. And then Jairus, the ruler of the synagogue in Capernaum, had a 12-year-old daughter, you recall, in Luke 8, who was healed by God through Jesus. He's not going to report Jesus to the Jewish Sanhedrin courts. These three friends in high places, if we use a baseball analogy, had first base, second base, and third base covered. And that facilitated to a high-profile ministry with crowds. In fact, remember during that time when he sent his disciples out two by two, he said, don't take a purse, don't take a cloak or sandals. Everybody's going to invite you over for dinner. But now that the government has a warrant out for his rest and Herod Antipas wants to, quote, see him, when he sends them out, he says, don't accept the same kind of popular reception we used to have. Take a purse, take a cloak, and an exaggeration said, take a sword. Maybe I could phrase it in every post office in Galilee. There were a picture of Jesus along with nine others of the most wanted. It's dangerous. When he came back to Capernaum, he announced this withdrawal to the district of Caesarea Philippi. So scholars call this the withdrawal narrative. It's withdrawal from Galilee and from Galilee's governor, Herod Antipas. Then we have our text, which is in the district of Caesarea Philippi in the withdrawal section. Matthew, chapter 16 of Matthew, verse uh, 15. He said to his disciples, Who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and scribes, and be killed. His first passion prediction. My friend, this is the fourth turning point in the life of Jesus. Not related to the ministry of John. John is already dead. But after they withdrew from Galilee, 
as soon as one of the disciples, probably reflecting discussions of the others, said, I believe you are the Messiah of God, Jesus said, I must now go to Jerusalem and suffer many things. This is literally a 180 degree turn. In Galilee, they went north to Caesarea Philippi. Now that they believe he is the Messiah, he turns around 180 degrees and heads south to Jerusalem. The Hebrew expression, set his face for Jerusalem, is an idiom that means determined to go to Jerusalem. In fact, he says, don't tell anyone that you believe I am the Messiah. This is called by some scholars the messianic secret. My friends, I would like in our sermon this morning to discuss this journey to Jerusalem and the occasions of the disciples being on a very different road to Jerusalem than was Jesus. Not only on this occasion does he predict his suffering in Jerusalem, but on two others. This section is Mark 8 through Mark 10. He predicts three times he'll suffer in Jerusalem. In ancient literature, if you want to show that something happened over and over continually and don't want to lose up a lot of space in your precious scroll, you put it into the text three times. This is a literary device. If any reader reads something is repeated three times, it means it happened continually. How often did Jesus predict he would go to Jerusalem? The entire way. And while Jesus is taking that low servant siat route, I want you to notice something else is mentioned three times on that road to Jerusalem. On three occasions between Mark 8 and 10, the disciples argue who is the greatest. They knew Jesus didn't like them doing that, so they'd walk a little bit slower and lag behind, and they get to the next camp, and Jesus would say, probably with a little sad twinkle in his eye, what were you guys talking about back there on the road? And they didn't want to tell him because they were arguing who was the greatest. This is mentioned on three occasions. How often did they argue who was the greatest? Continually. The entire way to Jerusalem. You and I have a journey to Jerusalem the next two weeks, don't we? Getting ready for Holy Week. Jesus' disciples took a rather high road in contrast to his servant Messiah road. Boy, are we going to be important. Always knew I'd be an apostle. But my friends, there's three other things mentioned on the journey to Jerusalem. They argued not only three times who was the greatest, but they failed three times. I'd like to suggest to you that you and I are likely to have the same three failures the next two weeks as we prepare for Easter. The first failure is mentioned a week after the great confession at Caesarea Philippi. They're on a high unnamed mountain where Jesus took Peter, James, and John. Remember, this is normally called the transfiguration story. Where they have a vision of Jesus clothed in white speaking with Moses and Elijah. In Judaism, Moses is the epitome of the law and Elijah the epitome of the heights of the prophets. And their Bible was called the Law and the Prophets. What What this means is they understood Jesus was in conversation with the Law and the Prophets, in conversation with their scriptures, not different from them, a continuity of the Law and Prophets. Remember when they come down off the mountain, they see a boy who has seizures. And they try the right formula, in the name of Jesus, be healed. And his seizures continued. So the disciples came to Jesus 
Why did we fail? What's the reason we were unable to heal him? And Jesus said, this comes with much prayer and fasting. The disciples' first failure on their journey to Jerusalem was not seeing the importance of spiritual disciplines. Christianity is much more than creed, statements of belief. There's prayer. Another tradition adds the word fasting, spiritual disciplines. One reason your church has special emphasis during Lent and extra meetings and suggested readings and studies is because you and I need discipline spiritually to be properly prepared for Holy Week soon approaching. So just like them, we feel like their first failure, to see the importance of spiritual disciplines in our journey. From there, they said, headed further south, and you would come from Caesarea Philippi to the Sea of Galilee. The disciples did not realize it at the time, but they were saying their last goodbyes to their friends at Capernaum. And remember, in Capernaum, children wanted to come up to Jesus. And the disciples forbid them, forbade them to come to Jesus. And remember, Jesus has to rebuke them. Suffer the little children to come. Remember it says, he took them up in his arms and he blessed them. Jesus liked giving bear hugs to kids. But wait a minute, aren't we very serious times? we Jesus is going to Jerusalem, we should probably keep the kids away. The second failure, may I suggest, you and I are likely to have the next two weeks. They're not looking in small and weak enough places for God's activity. They're anticipating God to use Jesus to unite the crowds and drive out the Roman army and become king. You are the Messiah, the king. Big work, power, size, big army. I wonder how many times you and I, the next two weeks, might walk right by something small and weak where God's activity needs to be involved. But we don't hear we don't see. I wonder if, if somewhere in your workplace you and I could be, in our workplace, could be more sensitive to something small or weak, or perhaps in our neighborhood, even in our family. It's hard to be patient with something that's constant. Maybe a the broad scheme, it seems rather small or weak, but can you and I be in the spirit of Christ? Suffer the little children. In fact, to make that point more important, he said it's better for you to go with a millstone around your neck into the water than to cause a little child to stumble. Millstones are not recommended as personal flotation devices. In fact, Jesus used the word donkey-turned millstone. industrial size millstone. Look at the importance of children. I, was once, had a, I once had a group of students at a Russian Orthodox church, and in their garden they had an ancient millstone. It was the size that would take at least two women to turn it. And uh, the millstone was behind me. Let's pretend you're my students. And I pointed over my shoulder without looking. You see why Jesus said two women will be grinding. One will be taken, one will be left. And there was a Russian nun watering some flowers behind me. I didn't know she was there. And she put down the hose and she walked up to the millstone saying to me, nyet, 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 nyet. And she gave this big Russian bear hug to that millstone and turned it around all by herself. 
this story is less remarkable if you've seen that particular Russian nun. I probably shouldn't have said that. But uh, look at the importance of children to Jesus. Well, they head further south, going down the Jordan Valley. On a map you can see that there are two areas ruled by Herod Antipas, Galilee and the Jordan Valley. They are Jewish. Plenty of kosher hotels and restaurants and delis. But between them is a pagan city-state called Scythopolis, a pagan Gentile city. Our next failure seems to, by good guess, to be there. They went by a city that did not believe. That's probably a pagan Roman city, believing in the pantheon deities, full of pantheon temples, athletic competition structures, gymnasiums. And it says, two disciples called down fire from heaven on this village that didn't believe. What is the third failure? Judgmental attitudes towards others. Not too unlike us. Do you remember Jesus said to them, I don't like you talking that way. Do you remember the first videotape released after Osama bin Laden brought down the World Trade Center had the line from bin Laden, Allah has just called down fire from heaven on the Zionists and the Crusaders. disciples had that kind of hatred against people from a different religion than their own? I always picture the following body language for the Old Testament verse. Judgment is mine, says the Lord. It's not ours. We're not good at it. We should leave judgment of someone else's heart with God To God, how can you and I know someone else's heart with God? Sometimes a person seems hard as nails on the outside, but they might have a soft place for God in their heart. And others, who maybe are using religious jargon all the time, of what sin does Jesus speak against four times more than any other sin? Religious hypocrisy. But they're dead inside. It's best for us to leave someone else's relationship with God to God. We're supposed to love them. Let God be their judge. Are there some folks, maybe you've been a bit hard on them. The next two weeks you might have some special intentionality to show some grace. Giving them a break. Love your crooked neighbor with your crooked heart. Hasn't God been gracious to you? Are you really sure that if you lived in their shoes that you would be that different? What is interesting is, as we follow them to Jerusalem, they cross the Jordan Valley near Jericho. And they enter Jericho, and that's the story of the healing of blind Bartimaeus. Do you remember? This was a beggar who heard in the distance that a popular Galilean rabbi was being led by, and he yells out of the top of his voice, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus hears that cry in the distance. Who is that? Oh, that's Bartimaeus. Bring him here. Jesus could hear the small and the weak above the crowd pressing around him. We have God healing Bartimaeus through Jesus. That's in Mark 10. Did you ever notice that these three stories of three, the three passion predictions, the three arguing who is the greatest, and the three failures, occur between two blind men? They're like a bracket 
that makes this a literary unit. In Bethsaida, before they withdraw to Caesarea Philippi, we have the healing of a blind man at Bethsaida. It's a strange story, the only occasion of that. He does not fully see at his healing. He saw people as though they were trees, and he was in need of further healing. I wonder by the Gospels arranging that healing story between our three groups of the three failures, and then by Bartimaeus, the writer might be saying, look how blind the disciples are between these two blind men as they're preparing for Jesus' visit to Jerusalem. Maybe they see the kingdom of Christ as though it is trees. Not clearly. And are in need of further healing. Isn't it amazing how similar Jesus' disciples are to the same three kinds of failures you and I have? May I remind you, even as they enter the room of the Last Supper in John's Gospel, an argument arose amongst the disciples as to who was the greatest. I can imagine Jesus rolling his eyes, marveling at their consistency. I hope you can join us tonight on our lectures in the afternoon. This evening we're going to talk about some amazing discoveries that help us with the next turning point in Jesus' life, Palm Sunday. We're going to take ten things Jesus does in Jerusalem, not tonight, over the next three days, that shows great intentionality and forethought. He'd arranged with friends to be able to borrow a donkey. And when they got to the wall of Bethpage, he got on the back of the donkey. Do you know that's the city limits of Jerusalem? And people brought the palm branches. We're going to discuss, it's going to be hard for you to imagine now, discoveries that we've made that helps us know why Jesus encouraged the crowd to sing Hosanna. Remember when they're singing, a Pharisee friend said, Jesus, tell the crowds to keep it down. This is dangerous. There's extra Roman soldiers in Jerusalem. They could be arrested. And Jesus said, let them sing. If they're quiet, even the stones will cry out. But in Galilee, he said, don't tell anyone you believe I'm the Messiah. What's going on? Why does he want the crowds to sing this? Do you know, scholars now believe, had Jesus not said, let them sing, the church probably would not have followed the first cup, survived the first couple chapters of the book of Acts. We'll try to understand that if you can come this evening. We're also going to look at other turning points. Remember, the Last Supper begins, I've been looking forward to eating this Passover with you, which means I've been thinking a lot about the kinds of things I would like to share with you this last night together. I appreciate very much you've invited me to be a guest speaker during the Lenten season, and I hope you, as I, will be encouraged as we see how gracious and patient was with his slow learning, slow learning disciples. And as we commit ourselves to the Lord, now these next two weeks, on our journey with the Lord to Jerusalem. Amen.